Okay, so welcome everyone um, to the official uh, Seamless Astronomy Colloquium of, I believe it is still October 2014. And uh, we're very honored to have uh, Christine Borgman, who is the Professor and Presidential Chair of Information Studies at uh, UCLA in Los Angeles. Um, but more importantly, uh, Chris is probably the world's expert on what was the title of her last big book, uh, Scholarship in the Digital Age, which, by the way, won the prize for the best book in information science from the American Society for Information Science and Technology, which for the astronomers here is their equivalent of the AAS. Um, so she literally is uh, the world's authority, and we're very lucky to have her here. And Chris has written a new book, which will come out very, very soon. January. January. Uh, with MIT Press, yes? Uh, big data, little data, no data. We're not familiar with that phenomenon, are we? <laughs> um, scholarship in the network world. And so for the last, uh, how many years, Chris, have you been studying astronomers now? Seven or eight. Yeah. Seven or eight years. Uh, Chris has been the social scientist with her extended research group that she'll tell us about, looking over the shoulders of many of us, trying to figure out kind of how astronomy research works and what the infrastructure is in the community and why astronomy is different than other communities in the way that we share our data and work with each other. And just for those of you who don't know, astronomy data are worth no money at all. <laughs> and um, I hope I didn't disappoint anyone. Oh, right. Martin may help us with the comets, asteroids rather. But anyway, um, comets. Um, and so, uh, Asteroids. Why do I keep saying comets? I'm thinking Rosetta. Did everybody see, by the way, this Issa movie for Rosetta? If you haven't seen it, it's amazing. Chris Erdman will now tweet it. But anyway, we can make money on, um, with Hollywood, but that's off the topic of your point, of your talk, Chris. Anyway, um, by the way, for those of you on video, I'm purposely stalling because our live audience is still entering, and we try to be on time on the internet, but um, not on time at Harvard. So. Anyway, to go back to the main thread here, we're very honored to have Chris Borgman um, as our speaker. And she's going to tell us about a study that's in progress uh, of the way that astronomers work together and share their data. And I think I should let you start. And thank okay. you very much, Chris, thank you. for coming. Thanks, Alyssa. And great to be back in this room. And those of you who are, who are here for the ADS uh, 20th anniversary about uh, 18 months ago. We'll recognize a few slides borrowed from a few people in this room um, also. I'm going to try to give kind of um, two talks at once and, and weave some pieces together. And uh, Alyssa asked me to speculate wildly as well um, at the end. So try to do enough to, to provoke a discussion. Um, the book, which is uh, two years of active writing, most of which was done on sabbatical at Oxford, at Balliol, the Oxford Internet Institute, and the E-Research Center, um, draws upon uh, 15 years or so of studying uh, data practices in a number of different disciplinary domains. And the studies of all of you, and I've interviewed a number of people in, in this room over that period of time also, have greatly informed this. And Alyssa um, did a very close read of the astronomy case study that is in the book, too. Uh, but what I want to talk most specifically is the work that we've been doing as a team of looking at astronomy and, um, and infrastructure. So the, oh, that's interesting. Um, there we go. No, it's not going to click. We will do this. And this worked just fine before we plugged in. Uh, can you get the slide to advance to the next one? That's interesting. OK. OK, tech support will take care of this. Um, well, I, I will keep talking while we're on video. So the next slide is. Um, the table, there it is, thank you. The table contents for the book. And the, the framing of it is around this much larger change in the way that scholarship is done, the movement toward more data intensive research, not only in the uh, physical sciences, but across the social sciences, across the humanities, combined with a big policy push 
uh, not only in the U.S., Europe, Australia, but increasingly in Asia and other parts of the world as well, to require not only open access to publications, but open access to data, uh, which doesn't actually follow the incentives for most, for most fields. And then the middle part of the book is about 150 pages of case studies. I build a model in the first part about data diversity and some of the different characteristics of fields that can contribute to the kinds of practices and then brought it back to some of the incentive issues, the policy issues, some economic issues. Uh, there's a lot of bibliometrics in here that Michael Kurtz and others will appreciate. And then more librarian stewardship curation issues are here, uh, bringing it together at the very end. So the, prepare to talk about any of these things. The parts of it that... Oh, that's interesting. Okay, this is a new one. Um, so this is the website from our team, and this is the uh, statement that we have. Uh, we started with National Science Foundation money. This is now a very generous grant from the uh, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and I won't read all this to you, uh, but to look at the, uh, the changing nature of scholarship, and uh, these four research questions are, are the, driving, uh, the driving questions. So we're trying to understand a number of things about new infrastructures, divisions of labor. We're very concerned about things like workforce issues. What happens when people who come up, you know, how much of the work gets done by people who come up through the domains? How much of it gets done by people trained in libraries and archives, by software engineers? What are the career paths for these kinds of people? How do you build the technology and the people to make all these pieces work together? And how do groups and organizations begin to design these things? How do they take them down? What happens to them when you get 5, 10, 15 years of investment in large infrastructure projects and you keep them going? Um, how do these issues vary? We're also interested in questions about preservation versus curation versus stewardship, when you want to think about dark archives, when you want to think about active archives, when you want to think about um, the, the long-term value to the field. Now, we've been looking at um, four different groups uh, for a good period of time. And let me explain these, explain these briefly. Um, Sloan, we actually started here on the astronomy side. Alex Zale brought us into this in about 2007, and I know, you know, to say that it's ramping down only applies to parts one and two. So this, well, part of what we've been looking at is how that set of data are being moved from an active scientific status into somewhat dark archives and moving into the libraries at Johns Hopkins. Uh, University of Chicago is doing uh, some of that work. Uh, but then even that's changed since then. Uh, Alex, got, Alex and Ani and others got a, a, about a $9 million dibs grant to re-engineer that, and it's changing the nature of how they're thinking about it going forward. Uh, we've been working, we've been studying particularly a data management group of LSST for the last couple of years. Uh, we've got, I don't know man, how many, um, it's you know, well over 100 interviews and many, many weeks of on the ground ethnographies of really having graduate students and postdocs embedded in some of these groups and trying to understand the, the on the ground practices. Uh, SENS uh, was a National Science Foundation Science Technology Center from 2002 to 2012. I was one of the founding co PIs. And so we followed this all the way through interactions between. Uh, scientists, technologists in different fields. This is not your kind of dark energy. Um, <laughs> this is another kind of dark energy. These are people who take uh, drilling expeditions out in the middle of the ocean and drill cores below the ocean floor and put sensor networks down below them and then take these cores back out and put them in physical libraries and argue about the biological versus the physical kinds of science and who gets to keep the, um, who gets to keep the specimens and what science happens. So for today, we'll talk about this side and about this, this cutting across of the knowledge infrastructures and the, the seamless astronomy group here uh, at Harvard has been a particular focus as ADS and Alyssa's group and how all of you work with CDS and uh, NED and the other groups around the world to try to build some kind of flow and framework we've been looking um, very, very closely at. So we'll, we can talk about those and we have plenty of publications on them 
for those who are, who's, those who are interested. So this is a, a way too long outline. And I will, I will skim through some of these things because I, I want to leave time particularly to come down here to more what the findings are of what's, you know, what appears to be working well, where, some of the, where you're telling us where the gaps are, the real problems, what's not working well, and then some of the things that are happening to try to bring those together. Another general point to make is, you know, as we go around and give talks and explore and compare to other fields, um, the greater world thinks that astronomy and genomics have absolutely figured out data management, data intensive science. You know, you are the bomb. This is, this is where it's being done. You have all the answers and everybody else wants to learn from you. Uh, but then we sit down and talk to you and you certainly tell us that you don't have all the answers and you're struggling with lots of things at the same time. So that's part of, you know, we're, we're trying to, you know, learn from you, try to get a big picture and feed back to you, but we're also trying to take these lessons to other fields and take lessons from other fields back to, um, back to astronomy. And we won't claim to have all of the answers um, on any of them. Um, knowledge infrastructures. Uh, always love the slide that Alyssa has made and it's she says it's not intended to be quite as elegant as it looks whenever you put Vermeer in the middle of something it's going to look elegant and I'm just I'm on my way back from two months in Europe the last six weeks I've been uh, based in Amsterdam where I've been a visiting professor for the Royal Academy of the Netherlands working with uh, Don's their digital archiving and networking service so I've gotten to see a lot of the a lot of the Vermeers uh, but and uh, it's been very interesting working in the Netherlands where you've only got 13 universities but you've got a very large commitment to science and to infrastructure and what you can do on that stage so if you want we can talk about that a bit later but this is this is the elegant way of thinking about the astronomer surrounded by his or her publications and data and tools and kind of loosely knit pieces over there that might be coming together now this is more what we think knowledge infrastructure looks like. Okay, and uh, you notice that our website is Knowledge Infrastructures UCLA. We've had a larger group uh, based. Uh, well, it doesn't have a base. It's sort of all over the place. But University of Michigan, um, Cornell, uh, Georgetown, and uh, a couple other groups. Uh, we've been doing things. And so this report is actually getting a lot of attention in other fields. And uh, some of the business world's gotten interested in it as we look at the changing nature of stakeholders. But I, I love this diagram because it shows you the kind of string and bailing wire where you've got card catalogs, you've got old um, old mice, you've got ladders, you've got gears and little you know bicycles and things. Um, I mean that's that's what infrastructure really does look like. It's it's pieces pulled together. The old doesn't go away. The new gets layered on top. Pieces gradually get added. Uh, pieces gradually. Um, leave the, the process. You know, given that we're concerned with data intensive scholarship, a big piece of it is publications, objects, and data, and how you um, how you bring these together. Next year, 2015, is the 350th anniversary of the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, the first English language journal. And the Royal Society of Britain is doing a very big deal around all of this. And then, of course, the French um, journal, which I can't pronounce, came out a couple months before that. I'm not sure if the Royal Society will say that much about it, but the Royal Society is, is 350 years. Um, and over the course of that time, you know, we've gone from uh, you know, consolidating publications, bringing communities together, and different formats, but we very much um, moved along to thinking of the publication no longer as singular static objects, but things that are part of research objects, that parts of clusters, things that need to get tied together in different ways. And um, Authoria, another link between um, our, the UCLA group and uh, the groups here is another way where you can do collaborative online writing and move to some of these, these next sets of tools. Um, I don't want to spend too much time here because I'm, I'm sure the least knowledgeable person in the room as far as explaining what, what the nature of data are in, um, uh, in astronomy. But it's certainly been a challenge, and we found this in other fields, is you, you, know, you sit down with people and you, you, know, you, get a, you do as much background work as you can and you interview them and you kind of you know, get to your million dollar question, which is what are your data? And you get a surprisingly blank stare most of the time. Okay. 
uh, people do not have a simple answer for what are their data. Is it, you know, is it the tables and figures? Is it the observations in the instrument? Is it the, you know, the more raw stream? Is it the FITS files? Is it the cleaned up? Is, you know, is it the interim things that are on the database? When, when the funding agencies come along and say, thou shalt share thy data, people are often very confused about just what data are meant. So even though we've been at this for some years now, um, we're, we're having a very hard time saying the data in astronomy are, you know, at X. Um, rather, it's many different things. And then we've got the issue of, of what are uh, the simulated data, and some of the theorists will tell us they have no data, and others will tell us they have data that looks like real data, and you know, a lot of different language gets used. So I think that's another thing to take away is we don't have a single, even in astronomy, we don't have a single crisp, clear definition of, of what, are, what are the data. We've been looking at um, you know, Sloan Digital Sky Survey and how that has evolved, uh, particularly you know, as they went out of active data collection for the first two phases uh, from 2001 to 2008. We've also been looking at sort of how this has evolved and the kinds of conversations and, and how they made decisions about data sharing early on. Alex has given us the, the email archive of the whole development of Sloan Digital Sky Survey and we're trying to, you know, without looking at you know, names, we're trying to look at the flow of ideas and how things change over time and some of the decisions that were made and that's, that's looking like a very promising um, trove to work with and the, kind, the kinds of data sets and, and data and how they're used and continue to be used and that's been a, a good window. Um, similarly, we've got Peter Darch, um, our postdoc that we got from Oxford, actually where he did his dissertation looking at Zooniverse and Galaxy Zoo and um, some of those with a history of science and a mathematics background. And he's been going to the various all-hands meetings and, and working with the data people and we're getting a, a better sense of, of what's going on in that community and what those data may look like as far as the scale. Also, what kinds of decisions they're making as far as licensing and openness and where Sloan and the other missions tend to do data releases where you take it through a pipeline, you get a really clean set of data and then it goes out with the data paper. LSST is uh, thinking much more in terms of you know, daily releases through Google and they're still discussing the licensing issues and what that really means and, and how that's going to change how you think about the infrastructure of astronomy. So we're, we're looking at that closely. Um, something else we're looking at is just what is an astronomy data archive? And we're finding various lists and this is uh, the, the couple of pages um, from the um, HESIARC are useful in that you get um, a long list of NASA archives and then you get a list of other astronomy archives, but we certainly found ones in addition to this and starting with NASA you get, you know, you get a US centric view. If you, st you know, if you were sitting in Europe you would have a different view. So we're, we're trying to get our, we're, we're trying to generate more lists of all the different kinds of astronomy data archives and then see the extent we can classify them based on which of these are coming from certain kinds of missions, certain kinds of surveys, uh, which ones are more investigator generated, observer generated, and uh, how, how, they, how the pieces fit together and what that, map, what that map looks like. And that's been harder than we expected. Um, we also thought, so one way of tackling this is let's see if we can just kind of make a sequence. Well, and last week we sent out one linear chart to several of you and you all answered back with um, other things we left out or the dates were wrong or there were this piece or that piece, which again says it's very hard to get agreement on anything that even looks like a chronology. And we, you get, I mean, we'll eventually publish some, some chronologies and with more clear and crisp distinctions of what these categories are. But if you try to date something, you've got to distinguish between what kind of a release date, official date you can find on a website versus what people tell you. We start to work on this <coughs> X, X years, X decades before that official stamp. Or yes, that project has that name on it from this date, but it really 
uh, was a transfer from other project of other name that started 20 years earlier. So even doing this, this kind of sequence or categorization of the different parts of your infrastructure is um, challenging. So we're, we're trying to come out with some maps so we can see kind of how these pieces have developed over time and sort of which ones were the base and, and which, ones, which ones are feeding data into others. And of course, even if, even if you can, can get that, each one of them uh, you know, changes radically over time. And this was a slide that Alberto put together for the 20th anniversary, just showing kind of some year-by-year -year milestones. And we've got many more since, and we were just working this morning on the, the um, next generation. What, what generation would you call this, Alberto, of the interface to ADS Labs? It's probably third. Third? Yeah. Only third in 22 years, 21 years? <laughs> An evolution, okay. But it's, it's pretty radically different from what it looked like in, in 1993. And the functionality is, you know, vastly different. Of course, the interface is vastly different. Just what you can do in terms of tying, tying the pieces together over that period of time. Um, um, Alyssa warned me that um, not everyone in the room would really know all the great progress on seamless astronomy. Oh, we were going to scroll your YouTube in the background as we started. We forgot to do that. I forgot to do that. Okay. Um, well, you will give another talk soon on the wonderful things that Seamless Astronomy is doing to, to the world here. Um, and so let me just sort of, you know, hand wave over this a bit, uh, but to say that, you know, kind of jumping way ahead, what the Seamless Astronomy Group is managing to do is really tie many, many of these pieces together in ways that are indeed much more seamless. And having Worldwide Telescope as um, a key part of this lets you pull in um, models of observations, uh, celestial objects, papers, images, figures, uh, various other research objects, research entities, and map them, on, not only map them to each other, uh, and other fields are happy if you can just build a research object where you can map, where you can do clusters, and you can start to say, this paper is related to these five objects, to this research proposal, to this protocol, to this set of software. Uh, they don't have the, you know, the unifying uh, metaphor of the sky that astronomy has. So the fact that you can not only do that, but then you can map it onto the sky is what uh, is the... The, the great and impressive progress. And it's something you're not going to see in other fields. I think that's an important takeaway um, between them. Now, we've also tried to grab whatever images and, and links we could find of things people had already done. Now, what's interesting here, and this is by no, you know, this is just a small subset of all the things that you might want to put here. It's also a small subset of the kinds of links that you might want to put here. Because in some sense, everything on here is linked to everything else here in some way. Most of what you see of diagrams like this tends to be either just point-to-point -point links or they may have arrows that says this one goes to this that doesn't really tell you much about what the infrastructure looks like. What you really want to know is why. What happens? Why would you want to move from uh, data in one place to publications in another place? And what kinds of tools do you get here versus what kind of tools do you get here? And how is the world, well, how's the universe divided up between what is in the galaxy and, and not in the galaxy? and so on. So part of what we're trying to understand from these interviews and from the ethnographies is you know, what do these links mean? What, what's the process? What kind of science is being accomplished by making these, making these relationships? So we, we will hope to get to where we can explain them, but we won't get to a point where everyone agrees on what any particular meaning um, looks like from them. And we can put ADS in the middle, we could put Worldwide Telescope in the middle, we could put almost any of these things in the middle. And if this is only two dimensions, we could do this in many other dimensions if you really wanted to get um, richer. Uh, we want to draw some maps and models. So we've also tried to say, well, you know, what maps and models do we already have that we could look at? 
and I need to get some dates for some of these. This is the oldest one that Michael gave me a, a good while ago. What about what? Ninety one or? Uh, no, uh, probably ninety nine. Oh, ninety ninety nine. So the, the TDS was. Uh, that was what I was proposing. Proposing. Observatory of didn't have at that at that point. So this was this was a. So, so we got we have various proposed views of the world versus views that that, that did happen or that may yet happen in um, in different ways. But this um, if we got the art we got the people at the top and we got the archives at the bottom. But at least these are type labels where many of these don't even have really type labels to show what kinds of relationships we're talking about uh, from one to the next and. Um, this one, um, I like your Christmas tree, Michael, um, that puts the paper in the middle. And this actually looks quite a bit like the, what's called research objects nowadays. On the one hand, you know, we're, we're trying to do semantic web kinds of layers to put these pieces around, uh, but they're very hard to curate. So you, you would like, you, know, you want to keep track of these things individually, uh, but they're, if you don't know what software you can use on a particular object, then the object is not very useful. So you want to keep that, that provenance, those metadata relationships. Uh, so these are conceptual diagrams. They're not necessarily things that you can manage over the long term well. Um, this was another one from Michael that has ADS as the center of the universe. Okay. Pardon? Not surprising. Not surprising, no. So, so, that, so it's another thing, you know, to talk about what an infrastructure looks like is, is where do you stand? You know, if, if, you know, if you stand with, with CDS, you're going to draw a different memo, if you, a different model. If you're going you know, to stand with NED, you're going to draw a different model. If you stand with Chandra, you're going to draw a different model of, you know, what, what do you want to put in the middle and what the pieces look like around it. I think I wouldn't use quite as much orange either <laughs> next time. No, that was a failure. <laughs> <laughs> On what those pieces. Um, so... Um, Alberto used more colors with ADS in the middle, okay, also. Uh, so this one, um, what, but what, do you know about what year this one is? Uh, at least five years ago. Okay. This, yeah. So, but this one has lots more bubbles of, of relationships and um, the publishers, and now, you know, Elsevier is, is a project of, or sorry, of Crossref is a nonprofit organized by the publishers and Crossref, who, who does not know what Crossref is? Aha, okay. The librarians in the room all know what Crossref is. Okay, so every, who does not know what a digital object identifier is? A DOI, okay, good. So start with DOIs. And DOIs started in the late 1990s as a way to get a permanent and unique identifier on journal articles. So journal articles was intended to be the, the granular unit because previously the, the numbers were on just the journal as a unit or, or the book as a unit. And then how do you tie those pieces together? Well, Crossref was a way to tie DOIs to DOIs. And so, so the fact that you can look at a list of references at the end of a journal article, click on it, and go to the other one, it, Crossref is the layer, and it's run actually out of Oxford, a fairly small group. DOI only has a couple, the DOI only Foundation only has like one or two staff and there's like six or ten staff running Crossref. We hope this piece of the infrastructure we hope keeps working because um, it's, it's pretty small. But these pieces tie them together and then we've got various other startups bringing some of these things, some of these things together. Um, so I guess a point to make here is that within astronomy you've built many more pieces of your own infrastructure than any other field that, that we've studied. Certainly things like ADS and CDS, nobody's got anything quite comparable to you know, really cataloging all of the objects, all of the publications that the community reasonably is going to use, and then picking up the gray literature now in Zenodo and, and other places as well. But even so, you are still dependent on some underlying layers of things like DOIs and Crossref to, to pull these pieces in. Um, okay. And one more of Alberto's um, a bit more elaborate uh, view of the world. But now this is starting to get us more into the kinds of research objects. And this is what you're seeing in, in other fields too, is ways to do this. And this is areas where I think astronomy really is well ahead of other fields of, of making, those, making those relationships. Um, this is one of my favorites. 
partly because it's simple and elegant, uh, but also because it, it shows what pieces are built and one piece, what pieces are kind of um, loosely coupled with, with different players. So the, the publications and the objects, this is the part that's most completely curated. Okay. So this is where you've got um, CDS and NED here, you've got ADS in here, and you've got, um, you've got more curation on that side, but this is the piece that is pretty loosely coupled. And this is where um, the archivists, the librarians, um, individual scientists are trying to add value and do more citation. So the, the push for data citation, which is yet another of the big international um, ventures that's out there, and um, I'm also one of the three co-chairs of this CoData XD task group on data citation, which has been an interesting and frustrating process, as though there were a simple way that we were just going to make a data citation format that was going to tie publications and data together with one structure. Um, and we have not solved that. We've been trying to do universal bibliographic control for about 5,000 years. And I don't think we're going to solve it with data citation any more quickly than we are um, with others. But the paper that um, Alyssa and Chris and Gus uh, put in PLOS One last summer about the study of data citation you know, building on ADS, you're probably part of that too. Um, the PLOS One paper on the, the study of how much data citation is actually, Alberto. Uh, the, the other, Alberto, my Alberto, okay, Pepe, okay. Um, to, and you found actually very little, you know, even where you've got this deeply embedded infrastructure, uh, you got relatively little direct citation of the objects, even though kind of buried in the AAAS code of ethics, it says you will cite your data sources. Actually citing them with, as bibliographic references, citing them as uh, footnotes um, is highly inconsistent. Now it is every place else too. The astronomy is, is no, uh, you know, no weaker, probably stronger than other areas in the actual citation. But trying to tie those citations back to the observations remains uh, the piece of this that is probably most difficult, at least right now, um, to do. Uh, this is another of Alyssa's slides um, and about some of the relationships of things that, that seem as astronomy is trying to, trying to build. And we could draw, you know, we could draw many more maps. Uh, but I think we are definitely getting to where uh, we're the, you know, the approach. This is in, you know, in, in the speculative direction. Certainly, the trends that we're seeing is astronomy is making, you know, considerable strides at tying together the publications and the objects and the observations in as, as deep a way and with as much of an interoperability layer as. Um, as can reasonably be done. So roles and um, practices. Roles of stakeholders is one um, that we're trying to look at across all of these projects and the views of the world from, um, depending on, on who you are. The, uh, the librarians are you know, assisting in various ways. You know, certainly Chris Erdman is a, is a major player here in trying to think about better ways to do data curation, move to a new generation of librarians and, and archivists, um, and the kinds of work happening at, at, at Chandra, and so on. Um, but we've also got um, approaches like you know, what we're seeing with Sloan Digital Sky Survey moving to Johns Hopkins, where they're trying to take more of a dark archive preservation approach. Is, you know, can we keep the data from bit rot? So, you know, so it could be used again as opposed to the level of access required for continual scientific use. And it's you know, getting people to think through when is it that you're trying to prevent bit rot, when are you trying to <coughs> curate and migrate, and when are you really concerned about stewardship um, and, and the most active scientific access. And then you know, things like the Worldwide Telescope, the Ambassadors Program, you know, to what extent are you trying to build an infrastructure that is tailored for domain scientists and specialists who, who know what a FITS header looks like as opposed to making these same data useful for kids in middle school, in undergraduate, 
trying to teach spatial relationships through studying astronomy rather than um, astronomy per se. Um, these are some of the tensions that, that we're, we're seeing coming out is, um, you know, open access is certainly the right thing to say and everyone's, you know, astronomy is open and um, so on. But it's open as far as, you know, certainly the major missions, but the investments in openness will vary considerably. When you talk to people who have their own instruments and say, I'm producing a half a terabyte a day, it's all I can do to manage it myself, much less post this and make it available to anybody else, you know, that, that's a different situation. Or what should the embargo period be? Or what portion of the data should actually be deposited? And by the way, where can I deposit it? And, and who's going to take the derived data? And that's one of the, the things we're seeing. I've got in a slide later, is that people will take data from public sources and they will merge it and then they'll produce new data sets, but those new data sets that are derived at the other end, there's not necessarily any good place to put those. Okay. So that you know, the tables might get stored, but the larger data sets behind them may not have a home. So you've got this sort of very open flow that may go off and we're finding all kinds of data um, uh, sitting under desktops and servers and broom closets and things um, in various places around the world. Okay. So some of the, um, the tools and, and certainly the, the shorter term small projects behave very differently in different kinds of, of collaborative patterns showing up. Okay. So strengths and gaps. The, um, I think these are the the characteristics that make the, the non-astronomy world say, boy, astronomy's got it so easy. It's just they got all this money, and they got all these tools, and all these services, and all these investments, and they work so well together around the world. You've got these you know, projects that go on for decades, and you, if you've got to share instruments, then you have to find ways to work things out and you have to make commitments about data structures early on. Plus, when you're in the physical sciences, you can have much more agreed standards on things like units of measurement and coordinate systems. In the, the biological sciences, you don't find anywhere near that kind of agreement on, on standards and practices and the kind of sharing that you get. Also, a view of the long-term value of data. And we spent 10 years with the Center for Embedded Network Sensing and at the end of it, there was um, basically no, no central data set ever got curated out of it at all because the, you know, building new tools was much more the point. The, you know, the observational data didn't turn out to be what the real value was where people will consistently say that the, the value are in the data. Um, but that said, we're still seeing um, plenty of gaps, for, for lack of a better term, uh, but more the things that you're telling us aren't quite working. You would like us to uh, that you would like to see work better. Uh, things that that could use improvement, and and some of which is is being built on fairly quickly. Um, so a number of people have told us that the space-based missions get much more stewardship and much more investment in the data than the ground-based missions do. No one's ever given us a really good reason why that is the case. Um, so, well, maybe there is a reason. Okay. Uh, there were um, committees of the, uh, the CODMAC, you've heard of those, right? Uh, the National Academy. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, and they, they were uh, supposed to uh, advise NASA. Mm -hmm. And uh, early on, uh, maybe I can find the document somewhere, but they recommended that, that uh, given uh, the fact that uh, there is this big investment in space science, mm -hmm. we cannot uh, allow that the data just get forgotten. So there should be archive, but not just deep archive like mm -hmm. NSSDC back mm -hmm. then, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, there should be data management. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the good mm -hmm. stuff you've heard mm -hmm. came mm -hmm. from that. Mm -hmm. And it was accepted yeah. by NASA. And, uh, and so as part of the mission profiles, people have to write in uh, how the, what they were going to do with the data. So data management plans, archival plans, all that kind of stuff. But also, I mean, it was also, NASA has a much more you know, top-down model than yeah. institution that run. And every bit that falls off the sky has cost a lot more dollars. 
than what you catch what you catch from the ground. Absolutely. So getting 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 a fraction of the money to organize the database and curate it once the top you know, once the, the total price tag is much higher, it's an easier sell mm -hmm. than having essentially a ground based instrument, you know, that's you know built with, with masking tape and say we still need one more string. Yeah. And the idea was also that with a ground based instrument you can go back and do re redo your observations. Well, no, which is not could. quite which true, is not <laughs> quite true because the time of That was the argument. That was the argument. Was the argument. Yeah, yeah. But I want to say another thing is that with the next generation of ground based telescope, like the 30 meters, the 28 meters, those, those guys, and we're already seeing ESO is doing it, uh, we really need to factor in data management. Seriously, because there is a huge man investment there. Yeah, it's almost like a space mission. Same, same price, billion dollars. But I think historically, um, it, you know, we have private telescopes. I mean, there's been this right. tension in the U.S. between private and public and vis-a-vis -vis Europe. Mm -hmm. So we started out with private telescopes. They were my plates and they were in my desk drawer and right. no one else is going to look at them. So, okay. yeah, so I think it Although, goes way, way back. Yeah. I, I, I have two comments on that. <coughs> but on the other hand, Harvard's plate archive is the longest lived archive of scientific data that there is probably um, and that's private and on the other hand and also the NSF has done studies mm -hmm. which have done things like recommend funding curators for data for NSF projects which have not really been has not really been done because mm -hmm. um, I was on one of those committees and recommended exactly that thing so and the Harvard archive yeah. is now going all online so yeah it's becoming both. Yeah. 20% of it is there for anybody right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we're certainly seeing a trend in, you know, in talking to many of you about these things being opened up, but there's still considerable unevenness in investment over different parts of astronomy. So come in the back there. Well, I was just going to comment, um, adding to the comments about the space-based uh, telescope, the time is so expensive that you don't do your own calibration. The project does the calibration and hands you calibrated data. You may have, there may be a few little extra things, but that I think is one of the fundamental reasons that has gone back 30 or 40 years because the data, because the calibration is done for the satellite by the project. Um, there's a lot more uniformity. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so those are the, the you know the kinds. Of, that's I mean that's one of the big dimensions that we're seeing differently. And we've you know been doing. We've done a few European interviews. We're mostly looking at, at U.S. based um, projects. But the also things like the observing proposals. Uh, you know, some of those data are going appear to be going into you know MAST or other places. But a lot of them are going more on on websites or they're going into things like going in things like Dataverse and other places, that there's less obvious places to put some of those than the ones that are coming off the, coming off the emissions. And we don't even have the, um, so the private telescope and certainly that transition. And uh, there's some historians of science who are looking at that transition from the more private to the more public and how that's changed kind of the sociology of the field um, over time. Patrick uh, McCray at Santa Barbara has been looking at, at some of that. Um, Okay, so I think we talked about we talked about this already. Let me give you one more slide, um, similarly, that we've got is um, the you know the curation of tools and technologies is, uh, and this is partly the whole you know idea about the whether the virtual observatory should be considered a you know project with particular funding which has largely ended or whether it should be considered as an interoperability layer and the IVOA as an entity that continues to meet twice a year and work out the kinds of tools and services that are needed for, for international collaboration. And we get you know, very different views of how one actually achieves interoperability, what the governance models are, what the government, what the government, what the model should be, and that you know, it sort of depends on where you stand of, of what you think the governance model should be of how you're going to keep all these places uh, going together. We're also seeing um, differences in opinion around this kind of coordination with um, 
some people saying you know, the value the, the value lies in the data and you should fund fewer new missions and in, you know, invest more in curating and long-term stewardship of the data that you've got. And then other people saying the new discoveries come from the new instruments and we should be, in, you know, we should be invested, with the, the money should be going to the new instruments and the, those are the, you know, th that's where the real, the, the best science happens. So that we're, you know, we're certainly getting all of these different opinions. We're not getting um, a uniform, not, to, not that you'd expect a uniform um, result from talking to a couple hundred people. Well, you can probably ask Arnold, I don't know if he's here. Yes, Arnold's here. Uh, your, your slide of archival use for Chandra, maybe you want to comment on that. Um, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's the, the number of publications per, um, per, per observation, basically, uh, keeps increasing more or less linearly uh, with the age of, of, of the observation, uh, which sort of shows that, yes, the data do remain uh, uh, relevant uh, and um, uh, are, are continue being used for uh, active research. Yeah, but, but at the end, it's a question of metric, you know? you know, because we know that, you know, there's a lot more paper that comes of all data, and the archives are available and easy to use. But then the question, what is really worth? Is it promoting new science or doing a better analysis of existing data? And that's where it comes down to metric, more than just, you know, just saying the number of papers is not necessarily the best metric. Well, people are certainly not agreeing on what the metrics are either. That's what I'm well, I think one problem is it's not only important to make sure that we have the funds for the curation, but there's very little funding available to analyze these older data. You know, Chandra and some of the missions do have archival projects, but generally a rather small number of them are approved every year. So people have to do this archival data sometimes without any external support. And in a field where we're far more dominated by soft money and people have to support their research in some way, what it means is that there, there aren't the, the ways to pursue this That's very valuable data, data yeah. as we should. And I suspect if there were, you might be more than linear. I, sus I, suspect, more I suspect actually that in many of those cases, uh, it's new observations where the old observations get pulled back in. Um, uh, so yes, it's the new, new stuff that, that pays for, for the research there. But the old stuff uh, continues being used. Well, and, the, and the new stuff may drive people back to the old stuff for purpose mm -hmm. of comparison also. Yeah. So I mean, there's a number of dynamics going on. But just to, to build on, um, on, on your point, is that something we're definitely seeing all across the sciences is on the one hand, the funding agencies are saying, we, we've got these data are so valuable, we've got to make them reusable. And at the same time, it's much easier to get a grant to collect new data than it is to get a grant to reuse existing data. And you know, even people in the business world who are all you know, hot about big data, this, that, and the other thing, will tell you, you spend 80% of your time cleaning somebody else's data before you can figure out how to use it. Now, if you've got already well curated data, like you know what, what Chandra, the Chandra data, you know that's you know ready, you know really ready to use out of the box. That's different than trying to use, say, investigators' data, the, the drive data, where people have maybe even taken their own pipelines, their own mashups, their own footprints, and, and brought things together. Those data are going to be even harder to use. So there, there's you know so it's some real mixed incentives here in terms of what the funding agencies are saying and, and how the science is going. And that, that's something we're seeing kind of all across the sciences. And actually the social science and humanities in many ways, in many ways too. Um, let's see, anything else on this one? Yes, I think that's probably one of the biggest sets of tensions that's coming up. Um, so as far as, I've just got a couple more slides here of um, future directions. One of the things we started to track just in the last few weeks the uh, proposals were due in mid-October to the IAU for new commissions. And they got 52 proposals and a half, I think five of them were very specifically about data 
and my colleague, um, Sharon Troilwick, who's much more the anthropologist on the project, went through the five of them and kind of plucked out the main themes, and they were just radically different. Really, really very, very different views of what, you know, of, of what is being proposed to the IAU for where the next commissions on, on data should go. So, and I don't know um, if anybody in this room was involved with those or not, um, but that would be something else to sort of feel out of, of where that goes. So, you know, it takes us back to, you know, thinking about, you know, we're, we're certainly moving in terms of kinds of integration, but not with particularly unified, um, unified views of the world. And these are, got that slide in there twice for some reason, um, and that these are, you know, some of the kinds of questions that, that we're thinking about at this stage um, I think there's a typo or two in there, about the particular uh, challenges of curation, sustainability, and um, integration. And those, I mean, those are actually very different goals. So, you know, to what extent do you want to you know, curate and, and migrate what you've got? To what extent do you want to sustain, you know, so, so, so sustainability has a lot to do with collaboration, coordination, governance models of, of a community. Um, and then the integration is going to require a fair amount of technology collaboration and thinking about um, interoperability. Um, we're writing our next proposal to, um, to Sloan, and one of the things, well, there's, there's two general themes we're thinking about. One is this sort of big data, small data, which can, tends to get set up as a dichotomy where it's clearly much more of a continuum. And, and, we're, and we're seeing that in astronomy too. You, you think of it as a big data field, but you've got, actually got lots of pockets of, of little data that might be out in the long tail. And it's not clear how well those get managed and curated. Uh, but what the other is the, the, just the whole notion of openness. What does open mean? And if, I mean, what open in terms of less licensing, open in terms of anyone can use them, open in terms of cooperation, open in terms of technology and tools. Kind of, what does openness get you? And, and what, you know, what do people really think op openness means in this world and where it's going to go from here? So that's, we're going to spend more time on that. Um, and then you know, we're going to track this process of uh, sort of that next generation of, of data policies. So I don't have a clear, this is what the astronomy infrastructure looks like. I thought by the end of five or more years, we might have a couple of really nice crisp pictures for you. Um, but I think what we've got is many different pictures, and, you know, and they're, they're beginning to come out in terms of seeing how where you stand seems to influence what kind of picture you might draw and what those, what those relationships look like. But certainly there, there's a convergence going on of people saying, well, we can't we'll divide up the world. We, no, no, no group is going to do it all themselves. And, uh, and who, should be doing, who should be doing what? Okay. Um, let me stop there. I know we've got 10 or 15 minutes, maybe, whatever, for questions. Okay. <laughs> We have a good discussion there in the middle, but we have time for a few more questions, Mark. Oh, I was wondering, because I've been doing asteroids recently, and I, as soon as you move out of uh, celestial astronomy, rather, and into the solar system, all the standards change, and they don't have so many, and it's all a bit rinky-dink from my point of view. <laughs> and I, I wonder if sociologically you'd come across, going from field to field, reasons why some field, fields are more organized and others are not. Uh, well, it, I mean, part of it is I mean, the physical sciences where, where people agree on, on, on measurements. This is still pretty physical this sciences. Is, this is still pretty yeah. physical sciences. Um, some of it, I think the, the ones where you've got these instruments that take 10 years to build, you know, that, that forces you into making decisions earlier. There, there's more standards there. Uh, where things that are more, up, say, a little bit more oppor opportunistic kind of science, so that the environmental science people that we're studying, particularly the embedded net network sensing, where they go out in the field and they want to contrast between what's wet and what's dry, and they want to look for, like, they're looking for things like harmful algal blooms. They've got to get out in the field to decide where they've got the optimal distance between wet and dry, 
and they don't always write down very well exactly what they did and when they moved it, moved the right. sensor, or when they dropped it a half meter in the lake or picked it up half a meter in the lake, and they may not always write down that this was sensor number 127 <laughs> from this manufacturer, and this one may have been 127 this manufacturer, but this is the one that Eric put tinfoil on top of because it wasn't working very well. Um, so we've been trying, you know, so, so we've got all these models of things, and, and they will you know, kind of track their data, but some of them are, are tracking their data in spreadsheets and things like Google Docs, and they don't bother to label the rows and columns because everybody who needs to use them already knows what's in the labels yep. and columns. So you know, coming back and curating that stuff is just, forget it. Um, and so they've certainly got the, so instead of data, da, so one, this is one of the things that you had in your lovely PLOS One paper, is instead of data release one, two, three, it's grad student one, two, three. <laughs> okay. Yep. And, and, we, and we certainly see that in many areas of the sciences. That it, it's not, you know, it, it's not something where they're, they're not doing a kind of science that requires long-term integration. Where it could even be an impediment, right? If you have to write all that stuff down, it slows you down. You just got to get on with it. Yeah. Well, you've got to get on with it, and you know, making the data useful for yourself <coughs> is hard enough. Make it useful for somebody else might be an order of magnitude more. Making it useful for some unknown other person on another continent, in another language, a decade from now is several orders of magnitude greater. And for this stuff on the ground and you know, digging the dirt, not going to happen. So I just like to comment because there's two different things. Lately, I've gotten more involved in sort of some of the next steps for standardizing data formats mm -hmm. and thinking a lot about what data formats mean in astronomy mm -hmm. uh, with a bunch of other people. So that's so we're moving a little bit into some grand schemes, mm -hmm. and I'm going to be starting to think more of general things. I'm working on a paper for astronomy and computing about it. Ooh, okay. Um, a general, an, uh, it's sort of introductory. And and the second thing is software. Um, which is what I do, and um, I guess I, curation. There, we do have something called the astronomical or the astrophysical source code library, uh -huh. which isn't really a library exactly. It's more of a reference to mm -hmm. um, specific locations where you can find things. And as a person who's written software that is used really widely and has a pretty good idea. It's very similar to the issues you said at the very end about data, mm -hmm. of how do you make software useful for people who are other than yourself, mm -hmm. first, far away, second. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I think for me was a big deal was I was on the World Wide Web very, very mm -hmm. early because that's where I put all my documentation. Mm -hmm. And I actually have stuff <coughs> I've been supporting for since the World Wide Web wow. started, <laughs> and, and some that's longer still, that's international. And I think one of the, so I've learned a lot about how to make it useful for other people, and that you can do it. So as much as anything, <laughs> saying that you can do it, both at a library level and at an actual specific tool level, it is possible to do, and there are structures, and we're working on sort of improving them. I think if you take what Jesse just said, and what Nancy said, and what Pepe said about NASA and, and so that too, or NASA versus ground based or mm -hmm. big money versus not big money. I think that the big money projects, just like you were saying, you know, um, invest in other people who can mm -hmm. help. Right. And I mean, yeah, yeah. okay, the TV that's right. So in this really case, big money, but a little money, right. relatively very middle money, I it's guess, is right. 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 So, in other yeah. words, it's actually it's making yeah. investment mm -hmm. in the people who actually do right. this right. curation data management for you That's the is pretty much the line mm -hmm. between yeah. you know your data are going to last and your data are not going to last. Maybe not last very well. Mm -hmm. Maybe some people make a personal investment, but most people don't. And so I think that's your that's yeah. the part that's broken in there. Yeah. Well, you know that. Well, well, that, the well, that's problem is, sorry, you know, is that there is a lot of you know talk. You know, you know, I have to put a data management plan in almost every proposal. But you cannot really put you know a budget item associated with. No. It's not something you have to do. And, there's no and the survey has to come out of the sky. Right, there's no, of course, but if Pepe one day decides, you know, I really want to go on vacation for a couple months, and what happens if the Chandra archive goes down? Who cares, right? She'll lose all of Chandra's money, and this will be like a disaster at NASA, right? If I go and I don't honor my data management plan and my NSF proposal, 
nothing is going to happen, right? Okay, but really, seriously, I mean, the, the enforcement difference about how serious NASA is and how serious NSF is is tremendous. And it's yeah, also but, I, but I think that you know, you know, money, you know, speaks loud in this case, where you have to essentially sign up that you know do things, but there is no real money behind it. Right. It's those unfunded mandates right. that are imposed on all the scientists. Everyone would like to have all the data available everywhere, and when you go and tell somebody, including past director here, maybe time to put some money be behind building the archive, you know that you have a data policy, you know, you get you know, a long silence. And yeah, I mean, I fully agree. It's a problem, and uh, it's a problem. I mean, NASA's under, as we all know, understood uh, and, and has a solution, but NSF is new to this job, and probably it's I don't know if uh, you can help or the community can help, but they need, they need to hear about that, right. that this unfunded mandate is not going to work. And the same is going to probably be for the Smithsonian. Mm -hmm. We've been telling them, but you know, it's the same syndrome. It is you want to have extra work no and right. you don't want to pay extra money. Maybe. That's chapter 10 of my book. <laughs> well, I just have one last question for, for the audience and for Chris, which is, although I do want to wrap up on the work point, point, too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, just for a, a, a few points during the talk, we heard about uh, uh, Europe versus the United States. And I think that especially the, the expensive ground-based projects in Europe are handled much differently than they are here. Yeah. So I'm just curious. If anybody has insight into why they think we can go better. Oh, yeah, it's oh, simple. Yeah. Ricardo Giacon. Yeah, you okay. Can you explain that for the people who don't know Ricardo? <laughs> well, Ricardo anyone? was uh, my boss. He, uh, he, was, uh, the, the, he started X-ray astronomy. And he was here for quite a while. And then he became the director of Space Telescope. And then he became the director of ESO. When he was here, he started the concept, I think he did start the concept Absolutely of uh, a, a mission which is not a PI mission, that was the Einstein uh, satellite telescope, uh, but it's uh, at least in part of it for the public and the data is going to eventually become public and the data is going to be an archive, it's going to be curated. So we did that here and that was the first time. And that's been taken over by NASA for all the NASA missions. And then, you know, Ricardo went to Space Telescope. So the same happened then. And he went to Europe, and the same <laughs> happened there. So that's, it's one person. He's, a, he's alleged that he's a, he actually is a couple of secrets in the Hori D. That Ciccone reveals all, right? <laughs> I think. Okay, so we need to clone Ricardo. But I want to wrap up on, you know, on, on this workforce point, and it's partly the, the big data, big money, issue is, and we're seeing this across all the different fields that we study, is you know, it's the unfunded mandate problem, but it's also when the data, you know, outside of things like Chandra and um, Sloan and LSST, where, where there really is dedicated funds to, to manage the data, um, the work that gets done is people on soft money, and they are librarians, they're software engineers, they're archivists, and they don't have a real career path. And if you have a gap in funding and you lose them, you lose an incredible piece of institutional infrastructure. And you know, and that's part of the message that you know, that's part of the message that you know we're trying to you know sort of hit funding agencies over the head with is if you you know if you really think the data are that valuable and that much worth keeping, then it's an investment that has to be made, and it's a human investment. It's, you know, yes, we've got these big technical pieces of infrastructure, but there's a whole lot of, you know, how many librarians and catalogers are involved with Chandra? How many are involved with CDS? You know, how many are involved here? It's, you know, it's this invisible workforce, this invisible infrastructure that makes the science work. And part of what we're trying to do is kind of you know, flip it and make that invisible infrastructure more visible so people can see it and say, if you really want this to work, here's some of the places that, that you need to invest um, to bring them up. So that, that's one of, our, one of our goals and one of the things we're trying to give back to the community. And all of you have been incredibly generous with your time and resources and, and feeding information to us over these last seven years. I'm sure Chris would be happy to take more in for a few yes. minutes after the talk. Yes. <laughs> so let's just thank her. Okay.